are from uh, the Immaculate Heart, uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish. That's good. I'm from most pure heart of Mary Parish. I actually, someone was describing to me there is a difference between the two. I don't quite know what the difference is between most pure heart and the Immaculate Heart, but supposedly there's a difference. And then we have three who are from your parish, Jeff, correct? These are choristers of yours, yes. So why don't we welcome them today? I'm actually, can I have them sit facing me? And you'll still see, I'll, I'll show this um, to you. And then, did we succeed that time? Yes, we did. Now, do you think we can do it with a little bit more gusto? Okay, if we're going to convince the people downstairs in church that we really believe in God, we're gonna have to do it with a little more gusto. So let's do that. One, two, ready, and. Good. Now what happens if, you know, music is never so simple as uh, to sing one note. So I guess the amen is as close as we get. But what if we do two of them, okay? Can we clap this? One, two, ready, and. Very good. Would one of you like to come up and point to the notes while we clap this again? Would you like to? Oh, okay, that's fine. Any other takers? You, you, right there, come up here. Here we go. You're gonna have to get us started, so can you count one, two, ready, and, and then you have to point at them and get them to do that. Very good, so you see, we're already reading music, okay? Now what happens if we put three of these together? Thank you very much. One, two, ready, and. One reason I use my finger on the board is I keep always drawing the eye back to the page. Can you imagine if we had children in kindergarten and teaching them how to read, but they never actually look at the paper? If you look at um, a lot of children when they sing, you know they just they have part of the words memorized, so they're just looking at you and no contact with the, the text in front of them, the, the notes. We want to do that. All right, now let's go for four of these. One, two, ready, and. Good. Can you see? I'm sorry. I'm. Can you all? Well, no, I'm not doing this. We have a note that looks like this. What kind of a note is this? Yes. A half note. And how many beats does a half note get? I want to raise your hand so I can, uh, so we don't have things being shouted out. Yes. Somebody raise your hand. Jump at it. How many beats? Two. Very good. So now we are going to say it's actually a ta plus a ta. But does this note get one sound or two sounds? One sound that lasts for how many beats? Two. So we're going to take that T out of there and just put them together. We're going to say ta ah. Okay, so we only clap once because there's only one sound, but we move our hands ta ha to show this one, two. Okay, here we go. One, two, ready, and. Ha, ha. Very good. Eighth notes. And how many beats does one eighth note get? Hmm, yes? Half a beat. Okay, so. Now, I would not explain this to children, but I'm going to explain this to you all right now. The other day I was talking about Takadimi. Basically, this is it's one beat. So if you only have ta, or if you only have a quarter note, you would say ta. If you have two eighth notes, you would say ta di. Does that make sense to those who are, okay. Um, so, for these eighth notes, we are going to say ta di, okay? And they all have to come in one beat. So it'd be one, two, three, four, ta di. Can we try that? One, two, ready, and. Good. Get that 100% together. Can we? Yes? Are you all afraid of me? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> One, two, ready, and. Good. Now, first 
couple of weeks just because I want them to be so solid at reading uh, basic rhythms before we move on. It's so important um, that we get rhythms right. So, um, for example, let's uh, put some rhythms up on the board, okay? Here we go. One, two, ready, and. Good. Now if we switch it up a little bit, we do this. One, two, ready, and. Very good. Now, in music, we have these things called bar lines that Dr. Calabrese despises, and for good reasons, but we do need them right now for the purposes of teaching. Don't worry about that so much right now. I'm just going to put that there so that you can track the notes a little bit better. Okay? So let's go on the other side. What happens if we do something like this? Let's see how we do with this. One, two, ready, and. Now, what kind of a note would we... Well, first of all, how many beats do we have here amongst these three notes? Yes? We have four beats. How many beats do we have here? Yes? Two. Very good. What kind of note could I put on the other side of that to make, make it equal four? Yes? A half note. Okay. So let's clap this now. One, two, ready, and. Very good. Now, what if we do something like this? We'll spice it up a bit. One, two, well, actually, let's do this measure first. Is there anyone who would like to clap that measure first to see if you can get it by your own, on your own? Would you like to? Okay. One, two, ready, and. Good try. What do we say for the, these two notes here? Toddy. What do we say for those two notes there? Toddy. Okay, now try it again. One, two, ready, and. Good. Now, there was one thing. She spoke it exactly correctly, but she clapped here, she clapped here, here, and here. Should we clap here too? Yeah, because there's a sound. So can you try it one more time to just clean up that? Okay, one, two, ready, go. Excellent. Now, can we all do that together? One, two, ready, and. This is the same or different from what has come before. Different. How is it different? Okay, it's an A instead of a G. Normally, your children in third, third grade will not tell you that. But uh, you're, you're right. Does it go up, down, or stay the same? It goes up. And how many does it go up by? One. So when we get here, are we still going to say top or say top? Yes. But can you do it? Does it go up one? No. Okay. One, two, ready, go. About half of you got it. Okay. Actually, uh, who wants to demonstrate? You want to demonstrate? No? <laughs> ready, go. Excellent. Can we all do that with her? One, two, ready, go. Ta, ta, ta. You know that last note. Instead of ta, we fudged. What did we do with it? We held it too long. Oh my gosh, that's uh, a great sin. <laughs> Get it right. Get it right. Actually, the only, what I always tell the musicians, the only mortal sin in music is stopping in the middle. No. We never stop, no matter what happens. No. Never, never, never. <laughs> Even if we're coming. But uh, here we go. Let's try that again and make sure that we stop there when we're supposed to. One, two, ready, go. Ta, ta, ta. Good. Ready, go. We generally have the idea, let's see if we can do this. One, two, ready, go. Hey, very good. Now, the hard part comes, we'll see if they can reverse course. What just happened? Down, then you go 
down by one, two, three, four, one. Okay. Ready, go. Okay, two things. Most of you went down, okay? And you'll always find that um, some, this will happen faster for some than others, and you just need to be aware of who's kind of at what stages and always kind of be working with that. So let's do this one more time. Uh, here we go. Certain piece that the book of Swedes have done, you know, several, several of those. There's a, a lot of wonderful um, music for for children's choir, and I, I've uh, listed them down there in the repertoire. It's also available for for download. And you already have in your mind what kind of sound you would you would aim, and that's really important. Um, these are several children's choir that, that uh, you should look into, American Boy Choir. To, to get a copy, there's only 30. So, and of course, part of the expense that, that we use for our trips, because this choir, um, the children's choir that, that we have at the Immaculate Heart, we, we would also try to bring them to festivals so that, you know, they would have a certain level that they can they can achieve and something to look forward to. So um, we are a member of the Puelita Torres. Uh, Dr. Tapan already mentioned that. And uh, to go in front of this child and this group of children and to teach them, they will sit down with you and share what they know. I would also, uh, well, when I first began, I, I was terrible with children. And there was a woman in my adult choir who had a lot of experience working with children. And for several months, she came to every rehearsal, six weeks at the Madeline Choir School in Salt Lake City, which is one of only two Catholic choir schools in the entire United States. And Melanie Malinka is the music teacher there. And that woman is the most amazing teacher I have ever, ever met. Never have I seen someone who captivates the hearts and the minds of children for the entire time she has them, from the moment they walk through the door to the moment that they leave the door. And she's able to have fun with them, but yet at the same time, there's no talking, disruptions, all of this. They are focused on what they do. And you know, for the first four weeks of my six weeks, I did nothing but with my little tablet, I typed almost everything she said. I mean, word for, for word verbatim. And after about four weeks, I was able to put the lap or the uh, tablet away. I knew what she was going to be saying, and so I didn't have to be sitting there hanging on every word. 
after those six weeks, I came back and it was truly transformative. So if you have a chance to go to one of the choir schools, I, I, I can't say much about St. Paul's in Boston, I've never been there, but in terms of the Madeline Choir School, it is amazing. And they seem to be very amenable to having people come. Even when I was there, numerous people came through and would stop for the day and see what it was like. So I would uh, encourage that. And if people question, well, that's a lot of money to send you out there. You know what? It's better than wasting the next five years trying to figure it out on my own. Okay? Go right to the source and just take care of it. Um, and then after that, there are actually a couple of books that I would really recommend to you. The first is called Teach Like a Champion by Doug Lemoff. Teach Like a Champion, Doug Lemon. And in this book, Doug, Doug Lemon is an educator, but he works for a nonprofit that um, goes around the country finding the greatest educators, not just good, but the truly great ones, and finding out what is it about these educators that makes them tick, that makes what they do really work. And this book puts together what he considers, I think it's like 60 or 100 most important things. And when I was reading through, I thought, I never even think about this stuff. For example, we ask um, a child, so what's a quarter note? Well, I don't know. And then we go over here, what's a quarter note? Well, it's one beat. Okay, that's great. He knows it. But over here, I now know that he doesn't know it, but I've done nothing to help him. Okay? So, for example, I say, um, what's the capital of the state of Missouri? Hopefully you don't know. Right. Okay. So wait there. Who can tell me what the state of the capital of, or what the capital of the state of Missouri is? Mm -hmm. Jefferson City. What's the capital of the state of Missouri? Jefferson City. See right there. She didn't know the answer before we started. I wasn't going to waste time. Uh, well, getting hints and things, but I went right to him, got the answer. But I came back to her, and now she knows that I'm not off the hook. I have to learn what's going on. You know, for example, when I ask children, so what key are we singing this in? D? Major. You know, 100% right. Never settle for 99%. It has to be 100% right. Otherwise, you're not helping them to reach their full potential. And that book helps with a lot of those things, even passing out papers. How many of them do they love? You know, beating the clock. After that, you'll never have a tr trouble with passing out papers again. And it's just wonderful things like that. The other book is called um, the, first, the First Days of School, I think. It's by Wong and Wong. Uh, so anyway, in that book, it covers the procedural things that um, seem to eat up so much of our time and we don't know how to take care of them. It's a good help to deal with the procedural things. Um, now the next recommend, recommendation I would have for you, how many of you have heard of the um, English choir master, John Bertolo. Okay, John Bertolo is a master educator. He truly is. And he, uh, he has a number of books. I, I would start by going to his website. I think it's bertolo.org, B-E-R-T-A-L-O-T.org. Perhaps someone can check that. But um, on there, he has a list of articles, maybe 30 articles, that deals with so much of the education of our youth and how uh, Basically, it's his tips for being that master educator. Very good. Uh, a couple of other books that he wrote. Um, immediately Practical Tips for Choral Directors. That is worth a master's degree, and it's much cheaper. Um, so if you don't have time to go back uh, to learn things, I, I would get that, get that book. He also has one, um, The Five Wheels to Sight Singing, or Teaching the Five Wheels to Sight Singing, how he teaches young children to sight sing. So that's um, something that I think is very good. Also, there's, uh, he's dead now, but uh, Father William Finn, I, he had directed the Paulist Choristers for about 50 years. Um, he wrote a book on choral conducting, and in there he, he deals a lot with the boy's voice um, and how to work with that. He's a great chapter on sightseeing. It might be the most comprehensive sight, chapter on sightseeing I've ever heard. Um, but that's, and, and plus, he just had a command of the, of the English language. It's just a joy to read. Uh, you better have your dictionary with you when you do it, though. Um, then also, as Dr. Calabrese talked about later or earlier, um, the uh, Royal School of Church Music, their Voice for Life program, um, the best thing would be to go out and get voice lessons, but um, and so that you can 
do that yourself and then impart that to your children. But the Voice for Life program, when it comes to training the child's voice, is the most comprehensive thing that I've seen um, out there. And it has warm ups. I mean, it's a, a complete go to source. The book costs about $100, but I think it would be worth it. Um, all right, so now that we have sort of gotten over the fear of teaching children, actually that'll take a lot longer than five minutes, but when you do, what are we trying to accomplish, okay? Now, one problem that I see in the United States, I get calls from priests who say, I want someone to come and do what you're doing at my school. Well, good father, I have good luck finding someone because I don't know who's gonna come do this for you. Um, there really are not those people around. Um, I, I know pastors who want someone to come in and to do these things, but who are they going to get? Now, in, I, I'm going to talk about the English choral system for a minute here. Um, the Anglican Church might have various issues, but when it comes to choral music, they know what they're doing. And number one, if you look at the cathedrals in England, I think there are about 50 choral foundations, something like that. Boys, and now also girls too, will enter into these choir schools about uh, the age of eight. Um, and when they come in for the first year or so, uh, they'll be taught very intensive sight singing, um, music theory, they'll, they start vocal lessons, they immediately start piano lessons. Um, and after about a year as a probationer, they enter into the junior choir. Now, as a junior course, and then also up through the eighth grade, you know, they're the British equivalent of the eighth grade, they will commence to sing through vast swaths of the greatest choral literature ever written in the history of the Western world. And they will sing it over and over again, because when you are singing daily services, it's not enough to have five cute anthems that you can spread out over the course of the year. You have to have large amounts of choral repertoire ready to go. As a matter of fact, many of those places sing more music than they have time to rehearse. So like uh, St. John's Cambridge might have 1,300 pieces in their repertoire at any one time um, and whatnot. So a, a lot of choral music. Well, these children, over the course of their fifth through eighth grade years, and I'm talking about the American equivalent here, they will sing through this first as a soprano, sometimes as an alto. And when you sing this, it becomes a part of you. And as this is going on, you're getting your weekly voice lesson, your weekly piano lesson. And uh, for those children who are just enamored by this choral music, of course, every chance they get, they're watching the conductor, they're watching the organist, they're watching the director, and just absorbing this. Well, then at the time that the, the voice, the voice changes, then more so now, they begin transitioning them down to altos and tenors and basses, so they don't stop them from singing like they used to. But now, through their high school years and into college, they go through that same repertoire again, but now they're going through as a tenor and bass, okay? So, at this point, when they go off to college, they enter one of the Oxbridge schools. Well, I don't know if you're aware of it, the Oxford, Uni Oxford University is actually made up of what, 30 or 40 different colleges. And every single college has its own chapel with daily sun services. So, and uh, you can imagine they need a lot of people to, to keep these choral foundations going and things like that. So now, at the age of 18, you know the repertoire. You have gone through this, edu this choral education, this vocal education. Um, your piano skills are amazing, probably if in junior high, if you were so inclined, you already began the organ and had been playing for daily services for several years. So now as a freshman in college, you can go in and take over one of these programs. And to be honest, many of these programs um, are far better than what we have, even in our best parishes over here, these collegiate choirs. Um, even, I don't know what things are like elsewhere, but uh, music is not, strong suit of any of our cathedrals in Kansas. So, um, I mean, these collegiate choirs would be higher than what we have. And so you go through this in college, you know, the, the four years, and of course, continuing your education with choral conducting, organ playing, and everything. And then at the end of your university, you take a gap year, and you go play as a, an organ scholar at one of these cathedrals, okay? So at the age of 22, 23 now, you're literally ready to be hired by one of the outlying cathedrals as an assistant organist. 
As an assistant organist, you're training the probationers, you're playing for daily services, you're singing with a choir, all of these things. And you know what? You've been doing this for a decade, so at the age of 23, you can. That was about the time I was going off for my master's degree. And what happens when I went in for my master's degree? Here's your one semester of Renaissance choral music, okay? And at the end of that one semester, you're ready to go. No, you're not ready to go, okay? I, I'll never forget, I, I'm sure Dr. Buchholz doesn't remember this. Ten years ago, I was at uh, the CMAA. I think it was the last time it was held in Washington, and you were playing down in the Crypt Church, improvising after Mass, and my jaw was, jaw was dropping, and I just begun playing you know, the organ at the master's level, and I said, so how long did you learn improvisation? Did you tell me that you had eight semesters of it or something like that? Eight semesters. Do you know from my doctorate I needed one semester of improvisation, and for our final exam, I got up, and we were all expected to have like a 16 measure little um, sort of toccata that we played. It was basically the me melody of the hymn and pedals and we just do around with chords up top and here's your doctrine, okay? Over there, why do you think that most of the, the cathedral musicians in England don't have doctrines? They don't need them. I mean, they, they have an apprentice system that works, okay? Now, if you look in the United States, I think we have about 193 cathedrals. Now, can you imagine if each one had a choir school? And let's put it, a very conservative number was graduating 10 students a year. So let's bump it up to 200 cathedrals to make the math, math line. It's not my strong suit. 200 times, so we've got 2,000 students graduating from these every year. Now, within one generation of 20 years, that will be 40,000 young people who will have been trained through this method. Now, I'm not naive. I know that even 1% of those, it would be a nice number to have them go into church music. But can you imagine 1% of 40,000 in 20 years going into our music programs? What a difference that would that make? And the other 39,000 and some would most likely be very willing to contribute to that kind of education. And that's another problem that we have is financing these things. Okay, so I am very passionate about that because it works. You know, I see I've gotten so bad. There we go. So that's what we're trying to do. How do we get there? I'm going to, in the next uh, 40 minutes, try and show you. And do I have till 2 or 2.15? Just so I keep on schedule. School. I'm going to sort of tell you how I do the choir school. Beginning with the audition. 2.15. 2.15, okay. So we're going to begin with the audition. I would seriously consider having an audition because that lets people know that what you're doing is serious. Some people call it an informal audition, some people call it a vocal trial, whatever, to make it sound palatable to your parents. When parents come to me, I tell them up front, the only way I'm going to let your child audition is if you're okay with your child not making it. Now to be honest, in 10 years, I think I've only ever asked three or four children not to enter the choir. So this is not going to be something that you do on a regular basis because I have two choirs. I have a senior choir and a junior choir. Whoever can match pitch will go into the junior choir. And from there, I take the, the best singers and put them into the, the senior choir. Now during the audition, what am I looking for? Number one, if they have any vocal issues that are physical things, I'm sorry I'm not a doctor. I cannot help those. And to be honest, that's usually what keeps a child from entering the choir is the um, I once had two boys, they were uh, identical twins, they were born in 25 weeks, and they were even, they're brilliant boys, good, good boys, um, but physically, they still, they're, they're in upper high school now, and I bet they're lucky if they're five foot two, five foot four, so there was some physical thing, and even when they talk, there's this deep huskiness. There's not really anything I can do with that, and I would be cruel to put them in the situation where they're going to fail. Okay, we want to set uh, children up for success. And I tell that to parents. I just don't say your child's not good enough. I say, look, two things are going on here. I need good fits for the choir, but your child needs a good fit for them. And it's not going to be right to put them in something that they are going to fail at or that they're not going to enjoy. And with the exception of one parent, I have always had a complete understanding, okay? And that one parent probably, even if I had accepted her daughter, would have been on my back for the next four years, so I saved myself quite a bit of grief. <laughs> now, in the audition, first of all, I have them sing Happy Birthday because I found that is the only song in our culture today that every single person still knows. I once thought, surely Silent Night. No, uh, Happy Birthday is the only one left. 
Within the first two seconds, I know if I'm going to accept them or not, if they can match pitch, because remember, I have two different choirs. So what I'm looking for is especially that octave jump, happy birthday. I want to work with them, and if I can get them to make that octave jump, then they're going to be just fine. Okay? So now I know that they're going into the choir, but that's not where I stop. The second thing I do, I actually ask them to read an English translation of Psalm 50, words like trespass and iniquity and things like that, because the children, I mean, think of how much reading they are going to do in this choir. All of that text, one hymn, let's say it has four lines of text, and it's never text that is easy to pronounce. You know, it's things like rain, tribulation, and these and thys and thous. If they have difficulty reading, they are going to have difficulty learning how to sight read. So I want to see how well do they read. I also learned something about them asking what kind of books they like to read. Then after that, I ask them to sing up high and then low, just going up the scale to see how high and low they can do. And while they're doing that, I also get to hear the timbre of their voice. What is their voice like? Is it uh, a pleasant one? Uh, is it a beautiful uh, voice but no resonance? Is it a voice I'm going to have to rein in? I mean, they're all the timbres and things like that, but I get to, to know that. Um, and also how high and how low they can sing. Um, and one thing, when you're taking children high, they're automatically going to stop at about an F, G, somewhere below middle C, because they've never sung higher than that in their life. I don't accept that, okay? Because they're, I, on a daily basis, I generally warm our senior choristers up to an E flat above high C, and they're just fine doing that. Kids are resilient. I mean, they can get so much more than what they think they can. So if they can't go higher than that, I'll have them, woo, woo, you know, things to get them up in the head voice. We take them up high and see what we can do. Um, so, so yeah, that part, getting them to see how high and low they can do. And then next, I will play random pitches on the piano. And like Dr. Calabri said, there are a lot of times that when I first start doing that, the child can't match pitch, but as soon as I sing, then they're on. You know, it's, it's amazing how that helps. I, I really struggle with singing in the falsetto, so my chorus was known that I just automatically sing an octave lower. If I try and sing their pitch, they sing an octave above that. It's just, I, I know that's not ideal, but that's, I, I, I have to do that, so that's kind of what happens. Um, also, the next thing I have them do, I sing, have them sing about five descending half steps. I, I play it through for them three times. I ask them to sing it once by themselves without the piano. If they can do that, boy, I know I've got someone. If they can't do that with a cappella, but they can do it with the piano, we're doing well. Some of them do struggle, but you know what? That's what the junior choir is there for. It works at their pace. Then I have a short little melody that I have that always has both steps and skips. Um, to see how they finagle those. Going from fa to re to do, that's difficult. I'd love to put that one in there and see if they can get that. Next, I also like to see, continue, how good is your ear? Often I'll play a, a major triad in first conversion, and I'll have them pick out what's the middle note, what's the lowest sound that you hear, what's the highest sound that you hear. Invariably, they always get the highest note. The second one that they usually get is the tonic. Not too often do I get someone who gets the uh, fifth of the chord, you know, the low note there, but when you do, you know that you've got someone really uh, spectacular. And then finally, I clap some rhythms and have them clap those back to me. So that's the uh, audition process, and it usually takes about 10 minutes, and um, the kids are very relieved when it's done. So then once we begin with choir, um, I will, when we begin our prayer, each child gets to um, speak one petition before we pray. Part of that is, that actually helps me to get them to know better. I know when mom is expecting, I, although <laughs> I once found out from the chorister that his mother was expecting, and I was walking down the hall and saw her with a bunch of her friends, and I congratulated her, and I realized she had never told anyone. And But her child had said it to me. Thankfully, she was very understanding about that. So watch what you say. Um, kids sometimes say things that the parents don't know about. So we get into choir. Um, first of all, teaching them to sit and stand. Can I have a chair? Would you? Talking about things that really help. You know, when they come into the classroom, they know exactly where their book bags go. They know exactly where their, uh, in the file cabinet where their folder is. They know what we're rehearsing. It's on the board. They come in, they can talk until we begin prayer. Then when it comes to sitting and standing, I have three different 
positions. Position number one is standing to sing position, and it's one because you have one point of contact, the feet with the floor. Position number two is a sitting position for singing. You have two points of contact, your feet and your bottom, okay, and they, so they can't slouch back. That's the singing position. I, I don't use that a whole lot. I, I really prefer to stand when we sing. Position number three is, okay, take a break. Now we've got the feet, the bottom, and the back all touching. You know, it's little things like that that they can remember very well, and I don't have to say, everybody have a seat. Well, do you want to sing? Well, position number one, it's all taken care of, okay? Um, from there, uh, how do we stand? I, I basically, one thing that I like to do with kids, it's hard to tell them to do something the first time and for them to get it. What I find is it's good to give them sort of a range of things so that they know the extremes on both ends and they shoot for something in the middle. For example, we start with posture. We have soldier posture, okay? That's where you're almost back and your chest out. Then I, we talk about slouch posture, okay? Well, neither of those works. What's something in the middle? We have our athletic posture, this posture that's always ready to go. And there are five points. Uh, I use the song head, shoulders, knees, and toes, except my stick, lumbar, and back, and whatnot. The head is just nice and tall, almost like the string of a marionette resting on the shoulder. Shoulders are always just down and relaxed, no tension whatsoever. When you're standing, just ever so slight curvature of the back, not much, okay? And the knees, slightly bent, and feet are under the shoulders, okay? And uh, part of this is teaching children to become aware, so that this just becomes a part of their oral experience, okay? Then we go on to breathing. It's amazing, when you're sitting there now, every single one of you is breathing properly, but if I raise my hand and ask you to take a breath, I bet 95% of you would breathe incorrectly. You would all be, okay? So we need to teach them how to breathe properly when they're singing. Otherwise, how are you going to sing musical line? Uh, if you're lying on the floor, it's almost impossible to breathe in properly. I'll have them do that for a while. Close their eyes so they have they can almost map on their bodies what's happening physically, and we'll do that. And then for the rest of their lives, you know, you just have to keep a watch for the raising of the shoulders. Breathing, keep a low shoulder and breathe deeply and they'll be fine. It sounds so easy and it's so difficult to get them to do it. This will take several months of just continually bringing that to mind, okay? Um, one thing, you know, there's a difference between um, breath control and breath support. I never use technical language like that, but we do, when we sing, uh, you know, for breath support, I, I want them to feel what it's like when the diaphragm is, is being used. So we'll often do warm up like, T T T T T T T T T T T where it's nice and staccato, where they begin to feel that again, they need to become aware. And then for breath support, you know, you have to hold it for a good 16 to 20 counts, and we'll we'll have competitions. How long can you um, sing a note or hiss out or something like that? And some things that help is to give them an image of blowing through a straw or blowing down on soup. So it's focused and there's not so much coming on, or breathing to a point on the wall in the back, something like that. Um, use images that they know and have fun with, you know, have, tell them to blow soup on their friends, they enjoy that. Um, next, going to tone, you know, open and relax. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, jaw nice and loose, keep the tongue low, the larynx down. Again, I don't use a whole lot of language like that. Uh, but that's what I'm ultimately looking for um, when we do that. Um, head voice and chest voice. It's very important that when you begin, you always begin with a head voice. And for a long time, that's all you're going to be able to use. And you almost need to use soft singing throughout all of this. Otherwise, all kinds of weird things begin to happen. So we do a lot of woo, woo, or um, whatnot. And, I'll keep getting them higher and higher and higher and things like that so that they get used to that head voice. A lot of downward vocalization, going down the octave and things like that. When you go up, they'll shove that chest voice just as high and as loud as they can. Bring it from the top down, okay? And after they begin to develop a good sound, then you can begin to work on resonance. Uh, again, I'll have them sing a really nasty and feel that resonance in the face. We do it until they can feel those things, and again, they begin to realize, what is it I'm looking for, okay? Um, now, as for um, tension, you're always going to have to be looking for tension in the jaw, the neck, and I'm just trying to point that out to people. Um, 
I'm not a voice coach, so I'm not perfect at that, but we do what we can, okay? Now, when it comes to sound of choir, you know, we have the English sound and we have the continental sound. How many of you have heard of that before? I've heard that thrown around, okay? The English, you hear the hoot, and then the continental is more, by the time you get south to uh, the Capella Sistine, it's just blah, you know, that type of thing. And so, um, the pure hoot is, there's nothing wrong with having a little emotion in the children's voices and things like that. I don't know that I would go so far as to say that I prefer the Capella Sistina, but um, something in the middle is kind of what I, I like. I do like a little bit of color. There's nothing wrong in a nice long note to have just a little gentle undulation in it. Um, you need to pick for yourselves what that sound is going to be. And I'll just stick in a caveat here. If you don't have formed in your mind, the perfect sound that you're going for, you'll never reach what you want. I promise you that. At every moment of your life, I lay awake and you can ask my wife, lying in bed at night, and I am thinking, how can I form vowels to get, like, it's really rather ridiculous, but it's, it's enjoyable too. I get to come to conferences like this and we can talk about vowels, okay? And uh, isn't that exciting? Yes, it's, it's exceptionally exciting. So, um, so exciting, I forgot where I was. Anyway, the, uh, so that sound. If you want more of the that crystal clear, think of uh, King's College, Cambridge. If you want more of an in-between, think St. John's, Cambridge, or Westminster Cathedral. If you want a very beautiful continental sound, think Regensburg, uh, you know, where Pope and his mother was. Um, beautiful choir school there, okay? So uh, those are some different sounds, but get that perfect sound in your mind. Don't listen to choirs who are less than that. Just don't waste your time. Go straight to the best, okay? That's my advice to you, okay? It's called diction for singers, for pronunciation of English words, because really back in the 1940s when that was going on, I don't, you know, you watch um, like Cary Grant or something like that, and there was a way of speaking that was, it was not English, but it wasn't that typical American either. It was just a beautiful way of speaking. And I find that the best choir directors, I was talking about this with Dr. Calvary's at supper last night, about Robert, Robert Shaw, and he said he had such a command of the English language. It was just beautiful when he spoke. And I think the directors who are able to impart that to their children, that we're not just sing, singing, um, give us this day our daily bread, give us this day daily bread. We need to communicate in music, and if we're not communicating, we're failing utterly. I don't care if we get the notes and the melody and the, the rhythm, everything right. If we fail to communicate, we have failed totally, okay? So really work on diction and things like that, and the, the word stress, yes. Madeline Marshall. Is it diction for singers? Is that the name of it, I think? Yeah, the Singer's Manual for English Diction, okay? Um, all right, now, getting to solfege. This is absolutely essential that you do with children. Um, now, I will admit, um, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I use movable dough as opposed to fixed dough, and the reason I do it is because when it comes to sight singing anything in tonal music, I feel that it's good, if I think about my own sight singing, when I sight sing, I actually don't think about the solfege syllables at all. To me, it's a, sort of a, an added step in the middle. But what it allowed me to do was I know what do sounds like. And I can be on T, I can be in fa, I can be in fi, I don't care where I am, but I know what do sounds like in that key, and I can get there. And so the, the whole machination of, oh my gosh, I've got to go down a minor, I've got to go down a fourth, and everybody said, or no, I've got to go up a fourth, let's say up a fourth, and everybody says, well, it's just, here comes the bride. No, it's not. Here comes the bride. Dun, dun, da, da, is so, do, da, da. If you're singing from me up to law, here comes the, here come the bride is useless. Yeah, and it's all the, get rid of the mental steps and all that. Teach them what does do sound like. So I can be anywhere in the sound and I say, stop them all, sing do. They can sing do, okay? So we want to give them that sense of how do each of these notes function within the scale. Quick example. If I were to tell you to sing, 
We got a minor six from here. Could everybody write down to ready to go? We're, we're, we're struggling. Now, if I ask you to sing do ti do, can we do it? Ready to go. Do ti. Oh, sorry, no, no. That's not what I. So ti do. So, that's our so. Now sing. Ready to go. So now the whole room just understood how to get from so to t, which is a minor six. Before you, most of you couldn't do that, but you understand how those notes function within the scale. That's what I think is beautiful about solfege. By the time we get to the senior choir, I'm not having them sing the syllables. It is an added step. By that point, they really need to know what do those notes sound like within the scale and how do they function.